we want to talk about where do our busy, complicated lives, where do, where do our real lives intersect with the real life that Jesus actually has for us? You want to have real life, and you're going to have to dig into some real relationships. How long has it been since you've been in a real relationship where you felt known, where you felt like you could really confess your sins, where you could really be transparent, and you didn't have to hide all the time? You're never gonna find real life chasing the things that God's not called you to chase. You're never gonna fill the gap in between who you are and who you wanna be until you surrender it all. You're never gonna find real life on your own. It's not gonna be hidden in a new home. It's not gonna be hidden in granite countertops or in front row seats. It's not gonna be hidden in a new boyfriend. Um, it's not gonna be hidden in a wraparound porch. That was something we wanted, we didn't get. Where it's gonna be hidden is in Christ. Well, good morning, everybody. How's it going? My name is Terrence. I'm one of your pastors here at Southeast. We just want to welcome you to our online service. We're excited that you're taking the time to lean in with us this morning, and we hope and we're believing that God is going to do something special in and through this time, in and through your life. So welcome, welcome, welcome to church. As you saw, we're in this series called In Real Life, and so we're just in talking about what it looks like to engage with the gospel, to engage with people in real life, and the impact that can have in our lives day in and day out so we hope that you're excited about that now at our campuses we're doing something awesome so we're in a series called at the movies and if you've never heard of at the movies here's what it is what we do is we take some of the biggest films from hollywood and we bring them into the church building and and we contextualize them to the gospel we find some of those gospel streams that are hidden in some of these movies and we bring them to life and we point people back to jesus through some of their favorite films now the issue with at the movies is because of the copyright we can't show it to you online so here Here's our encouragement to you. If you live anywhere near a Southeast campus, we encourage you to get to a campus to experience at the movies. Thursday nights or Sunday mornings, you are invited to come and experience at the movies. Popcorn and Coke and real people in real life with awesome, awesome movies. And we want you to be a part of that. Now, as we said, we're in this In Real Life series specially made for you and our online family. I think Steven is at our Crown Recovery Campus. He's gonna tell us a little bit more about that. What's up, Steven? Yo, Terrence, yes, I'm in St. Catherine, uh, Kentucky at our Crown Recovery Campus. Uh, big stuff happened, but I want to remind everyone, Terrence is speaking next week within Real Life Sermon Series, so uh, tune in next week to hear from Terrence. Looking forward to that. Uh, and this week we have Matt Reagan uh, for sure. Yeah, you know, we're getting set for worship here at Crown Recovery. Got the fellows behind me uh, getting some pre-worship on before the service gets started. And uh, this is a special place here at Crown Recovery. We've had uh, dozens of baptisms here, just so many big things happening through God here. Now, this campus began as a watch party, and it's grown to be so much more than that. Uh, it's now one of our campus locations. We have a dedicated staff staff team that's a part of this. Uh, but one of the people here that I've gotten to know that's a part of this unique community is named Naquan. You know, I got to know Naquan uh, through my online group. He joined an online group, and that's when I got to know him. Uh, but this past week, we were able to catch up with Naquan, with a few from our SE Online team, to get his story because uh, he's got such a unique perspective of a guy that was a part of uh, Southeast Online. He's been a part of the Crown Recovery Campus, and now he's so much more. He's a leader out here as well. And I promise you're going to hear a story and be challenged by it. Uh, uh, you're going to be encouraged by it. And so we're going to be rolling that story. It connects to the In Real Life Stories uh, for this message series. We're going to roll that right after Matt's message. So Terrence, stay tuned to hear this powerful story from Naquan. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much, Stephen. And as he said, make sure you stick around. Don't log off right when the sermon ends, but stick around. You don't want to miss the story. Here's a sneak peek into the story, man. It is a story of what it looks like to, number one, engage with our online services with an authentic hope, but number two, to engage with people in the impact that God can do when we engage in those two things. So you don't want to miss that story. It's a powerful story and a testament to the work of God and the lives of people in our community. So we're just so excited about that. Now, as we say every week, man, we want to know you. We want to be in relationship with you. We want this to feel like family. So there are two easy ways, man, that you can just connect with us today. So number one, throughout the services, we're always going to have a chat feature available to you. And that chat feature has people ready to engage with you, whether you have prayer requests that come up mid-service or whether 
and you just want to be in an amen corner and just say amen to something that's happening in the service. We want you to do that. Use the chat feature. This is very interactive. You don't have to just sit and watch, but you can lean in. The second way is maybe something comes to mind later or maybe something more private is on your heart. We want you to use another feature that we have and it's connect to 733-733. And what that does is it sends an easy to fill out form to your phone. And when you fill that out, it comes to one of our pastors on staff and somebody will reach out to you specifically to engage with you and see what it is and how we might lean into your life, to your story and walk with you in this season. So please, please don't be shy. Use that feature. Let us know you. Let's do life together. As we said, man, we're, we're getting ready for church. We're at our beautiful campus. It's a beautiful day, and I hope you're ready to lean in. I hope your heart's ready. I think we're going to go to worship because they're ready for us. So, hey, I'm challenging you. Get up on your feet and get ready. Let's go. Let's get our hands together. Let's get our hearts and minds prepared for worship. We all have a testimony because we know our God is risen, and he's doing all that we, all that he's doing in our lives. Let's say that. I saw Satan fall like lightning I saw darkness run for cover But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in hell Sing this with us I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrection power Yes I do Still the miracle that I just can't get over Oh, my name is registered in heaven Come on Yes, my praise belongs to you forever Oh, this is my testimony From death to life Cause grace rewrote my story Oh, I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous Testimony, this is my testimony. Oh, let's come together. Come together, sons and daughters. We're bought with blood and washed in water. Oh, sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Oh, our God. Finish what he started. Yeah, our God will finish what he started. Oh, this is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. 
it's not a solid rock With nations rising and fall Lord, you steal my heart When tomorrow's on my mind In words This place is not my home You're with me in the night I know you chose me Because you love me No powers of hell Can stand this I know you're for me I know you're for me If you set it all in motion You can calm this ancient soul Remind us Lord Remind me now to trust you And see the mountains that you move You used to make ways in
But I know you chose me because you love and there's no power of hell that can stand against that word. God, we thank you right here, right now. We are so unworthy. Whew. There's no reason that you'd choose any of us. <laughs> but still you do. It's how great your love is. And so I don't want to take a moment and just pray to pray. I want to just say thank you. That love is too deep, too wide, too great for me to even fathom, for us to even understand today. But God, would you help give us a glimpse? For those in the room that are really struggling today, for those that have no idea who you are, or what your love is, or what it's like, God would, for some reason, somehow, in some supernatural way, would they feel that now? But they know that now, that there is nothing, nothing, nothing that they have done, said, or will do that will ever change that love you have for them or for me or for any of us. So God, we just sit, pause right now and just say, thank you that you love us. Thank you that there is a hope beyond this world that even when it's all said and done, I know where I'm going. And that is in your presence and that love that lasts forever and ever and ever and ever. And so as a church, we just collectively say thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen, church. Y'all may be seated. Well, hey, family, we are in week two of the Real Life series and excited to spend some time with you. We're going to spend time in Colossians. That's kind of the series that we're in. Last week was chapter one. This week is chapter two, if you want to grab your Bibles. And so here's what we want to talk about. We want to talk about the real life that Jesus offers. And one of the things we talked about last week, if you if you didn't get to catch it, uh, please go back and listen. If not, hear this, and let me summarize it like this. You'll never have the real life Jesus offers if you're chasing the fake Jesus. So our heart for you, uh, you know, Paul's heart for the Colossian church, is that you would really walk into the real life that you're made for, that you'd have real joy, that you'd have real relationships, that you'd have real hope and real faith. We want it to be real. We don't like fake around here. And so that's what we're going to step into. And as a matter of fact, um, Paul, when he writes the, the church in Colossae, it was a church he had never been to. Some of you, I've never seen you before. We've never met before. But I promise you that what we talk about today is going to have an impact on you the way it's had an impact on me. And so we're just going to dive into a chapter 2 of Colossians where we're just going to lean into Paul's heart for a group of people that he had never met before. And he says simply this, here's my goal. My goal is that they, meaning all those people in that town and in surrounding, that they may be encouraged in heart, that they would be united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. Chapter 2, verse 9, he's going to say it like this. He's going to say it like this. He's going to say, for in Christ... All of the fullness of the deity, talking about God, the fullness of deity, lives in bodily form. That's in Jesus. And in Christ, I love this. This is like literally if you could pick a thesis for Colossians as a whole entire book, it's this sentence. And in Christ, 
you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. And it's kind of like this, this, this word fullness, you heard it at the beginning, you heard it in this, in this moment. He's going to say this word over and over again. It's this Greek word, plerao. That's what this fullness word means. And what it is, it's, it's like fullness, completeness. It's like this. It's like if you had a cup, it's filled to the measure where literally you're lacking nothing and you couldn't put another thing in it if you possibly tried, meaning if you bump me, I'll spill it. So... Paul says, listen, I know you want that full life. I want you to know that that life is available to you. But what he's going to do in chapter 2 is he's going to say, but I also understand what many of you already know, that finding that real life, walking into that real life, having the cup of your life really be to the, to the, to the brim so that when people bump into you, it's just joy. And when people bump into you, it's just peace and it's grace. That sounds fantastic, but Finding that real life in Jesus, for you would say that real life has been real hard. I mean, the gift is good. I know the gift is good, but the road has not been easy. And if we're being honest, there's just been some barriers along the way, right? Well, it made me think about this. It made me think about one of my good gifts. I have five kids, and the very last one, his name's Luke. And I'll never forget, October 8th, it was about 5.30 in the morning, when this good gift was about to show up on the scene. And as he showed up on the scene, my wife came in in the morning, just kind of nudged me and said, hey, baby, um, you know, it's about that time. Uh, I think we're ready. So listen, I've already had four kids before. I know how this works. You pack the bags, you drop the kids, and we just start this leisurely drive into the hospital that morning. We got this thing. We got this. <laughs> but about five minutes into our 25 to 30 minute drive, my wife looks over at me with a, with a look of panic and she's like, baby, we got to go now. <laughs> and so we start driving. She starts breathing. I start praying out loud. And I'm telling you, we are flying. I won't say online how fast. We were flying to the hospital. And so as we're going on these roads, it felt like it felt like rush hour. It felt like everybody was in our way. Everybody was driving that morning. We get on the kind of outer loop. We make it to the interstate. And y'all, I am flying down the road. And about the time, about maybe a mile to our exit where we're going to get off and we're going to kind of make our way over to the, to, the, to the hospital. I mean, the hospital's like right there. I can almost see it. But here we are on the highway, all four lanes stopped with traffic. And I just kind of looked at my wife, and obviously, like, they're not moving. And I got a baby coming. And so my, my, my bride just kind of reaches over in, in the midst of uh, just a lot of pain, and she grabs me, and she squeezes me. She says, baby, whatever it takes, meaning we are not going to have this baby in the car. <laughs> and so I'm just telling you, I'm like, if you knew me, I'm the least honky guy on planet Earth. I don't honk at people. I'm just like, you'll figure it out. But here's the thing. I'm like honking, flashing. I'm driving on the side. I'm driving in the grass. As a matter of fact, I get up on this big exit to make our way almost over to this hospital exit. And as I get up there, we've run over so much debris that I'm sitting here thinking in my mind, um, how in the world have we not popped a tire? And just about that time, I look down, tire pressure gauge. Now, not only am I on the side of the road, not only am I flashing my lights, but now I've got a flat tire. We still have a mile and a half to go, and we finally make it up to the hospital. We've got the valet, this sweet little kid out front, and here I pull up, and I didn't mention, by the way, the smoke rolling off my engine. I had to get it fixed later. Flat tire. We open the door, and my wife's water breaks on, literally, like, on the ground right there, and I'm just sitting there going, you've got to be kidding me, and he looks at me, and he says, we don't have any wheelchairs. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. This is the worst morning ever. So I sprint over to the emergency room and I grab, I literally just run into the emergency door. It's like hundred yards away. And I steal, I just grab a wheelchair and I start sprinting across the car. And all these people are going, where's this guy going? They're chasing me. We grab her. Uh, they, they start to take her and they, they pull her into, into the hospital and they take her into an elevator. And I kind of turn and I'm looking at the car and I'm looking at the valet and I took the keys. I'm like, I'm so sorry. And I just tossed them to him. So then I turned around and I look for my wife and my wife is gone. They've left me in the elevator and I don't know where they're going and I feel overwhelmed and I'm just sitting there and I, I literally said this out loud in the lobby of this hospital. I'm like, where do they, where do they have the babies? Like where, and this lady was like, floor two. So I run into the elevator and I go up to floor two and I can hear my wife in the distance going, where's my husband? So I'm like chasing to find her. We're in triage and I grab them. And they're trying to check us in. I'm like, we don't have time. They're, they're thinking we, this is our first kid. I'm like, trust me, 
were about to pop. So I wheel her in, lift her legs up, and literally I catch the baby, sweet little Luke, makes his arrival into our lives. Now listen, why do I tell you that? because we've never had such a good gift. And I'm telling you, he is the best surprise of our lives six years after our four other children. We've never had such a good gift, but I've never had more barriers and obstacles ever in my life with any of their births. And one of the things that, 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 that made me uh, really kind of dive into this passage today is we have been given a good gift. And I wanna make sure that I'm being clear, and I hope that you know that. You have been given, we have been given such a good gift. We have fullness in Christ. Fullness in Christ. Like everything you can imagine, fullness in relationship, fullness in hope, fullness in heart. He has so much to offer. And, um, and there's some barriers that you and I run to all the time that are keeping us. that are keeping us from this full life. So what are the barriers? Well, Paul writes to them, and I, I love the way that he writes this. In chapter 2, verse 6, he just says this. He says, so then, just as you receive Christ, Jesus uh, our Lord, he says, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. He says, listen, I understand, like Paul understands, I'm, I'm telling you as a pastor, I understand how hard it has been for you to leave your empty old life. And I understand, like, there's something about leaving what's old that after you, after you get back on the road, and even though you know you've been given a gift, and even though you know that God's taking you somewhere, there is something about looking back and forgetting how empty the emptiness was. There is something about looking back and going, you know what, at least it wasn't complicated, at least it wasn't, and you forget all the reasons that it was robbing your soul, and you start to think, well, maybe this journey into real life with Jesus, maybe, maybe it'd just be easier if I went back. I'm just going to say this, there are a lot of people that, that instead of leaning into this real life that Jesus offers, head back to the empty way of the past, and Paul just says, don't do it, man. Don't do it. What Jesus has to offer is so good, but he's going to have to give you legs, and he's going to have to give you strength. He's going to have to get you rooted. You're going to have to get this in your blood. It's not going to be easy. I promise you, getting my son, <laughs> getting my son born that day or, or, or moving to that place where he could be born in a healthy way, it wasn't easy. But in your mind, you have to start thinking. I think Paul would say this, but, but is there another option? Like, do you really want the empty fake life behind her? Do you want to press forward? He says, listen, you're going to have to, you're going to have to lean in. You're going to have to have a no matter what it takes kind of attitude and heart to just say, I'm not going back to the empty, empty, futureless, hopeless life that I had. So Paul says, that's one barrier. But that's not, that's not the only barrier. The second barrier he recognizes for this group is a word called syncretism. Now, let me explain that. Some of you may know, not know what that is, but in verse 8, he says it like this. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy. Here's what it does. It depends on human tradition and elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. And syncretism is this word where it's basically like it's Jesus plus kind of everything. As a matter of fact, um, this, let me put it in terms that'll make sense to you. I was literally on Monday sitting with a guy who was like, man, I'm all about Jesus and, and, I'm, and I'm also a Buddhist. And I was like, I, I don't think that you know <laughs> that Buddhism and like the way of Jesus and Buddhism, um, they might have some similarities, but that's like saying I'm, I'm married to two women and I'm being faithful to my wife. It just, I'm just being honest, it just doesn't work that way. There's something about um, the way that people will take like the principles of Jesus and then they just start adding other things. I, I, I watch it all the time. Not, and, and again, I don't mean to be mean, I don't know where you are right now, but it's, it's, it's just, just real when people read, you know, they're, you know, they're looking for their horoscope for their future and trusting in Jesus. Part of me is just like, hey, a horoscope <laughs> is not is like the antithesis of what the gospel is. The gospel is is that he knows your future. He's written it on on your heart and he all you have to do is lean in and trust him and this other thing is how do I find this wisdom? 
what they had done with their lives is they started just taking all these other religions and faiths and just kind of packing them into Jesus and just kind of feeling like they're the same. And Paul just says, hey, I just want to be honest with you. Just be careful. That's not how following Christ, the real Jesus, looks. And you're never going to find real life if you're not pursuing the real Jesus. The third thing is, is what you would know pretty well, and that's legalism. And, and literally, uh, what the passage that he, verse 13, he just says this. He says, listen, when you were dead in your sins and in the circum, uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins. He, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us and has taken it away, nail it to the cross. There was a group of people that were saying, look, yes, Jesus' grace, and yes, he's been good, but they just started coming up with a list of all the things that you had to do. And pretty soon, all these people are thinking that my way to Jesus is if I earn it, if I do this, if I show up, if I get circumcised, if I don't do this, Paul just says, hey, listen, man, one of the barriers that you're going to run into is you're going you're to step into the grace of Jesus, and then you're going to start thinking that you need to work for it. Listen, you don't, you can't earn the grace of Jesus. And every single time that we try to fill our lives with the rules and the regulations, because we think if we do that, we'll just make him proud, or if we do that, we'll really find real life. Brother, sister, you're never going to find real life pursuing rules and regulations. The only way you find real life is when you step into the real grace of Jesus. Number four, he challenges this thing called, I'm just going to call it false worship. He just says it like this, verse 18, he says, Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. What happened was, and this happens in religious circles, where you're like, man, all these things around Jesus, man, angels are pretty incredible. I mean, look at what they do and look at how they are. And man, they're so shiny and they have power. And all of a sudden you're like, yeah, I, I worship Jesus, but man, they're so amazing. And they somehow had started worshiping angels too. And I know it sounds crazy to you, but y'all, we do it all the time. We do it, we see a leader in the church, and we're like, man, look how shiny they are, and look how perfect they are, and when they speak, man, it just challenges my heart. And we can, I know it sounds crazy, but we can worship people sometimes, and that get in the way of us worshiping Jesus. And Paul just says, listen, man, I need you to be careful. You gotta make sure your worship is just centered on Jesus. You, your eyes are going to worship a lot of things around Jesus. Just know that those things are great, but there's only one Jesus. And then ultimately, I think Paul speaks to the biggest, if I'm being honest, the biggest and most real barrier in verse 15 when he just says, having disarmed the powers and authorities, Jesus, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. And Paul just says it like this. He just says, listen, um, the biggest barrier that a lot of you are going to face, you can't figure out why it has power in your life. You can't figure out why, why that, that addiction, you can't figure out why that wound from your father, you can't figure out, you for the life of you have wanted to change, have wanted to step into the real life that you were made for, but you keep bumping into a power, you keep bumping into a, like a guardrail that you can't figure out. Your heart so wants to change, but you just can't. You can't break that addiction. You can't let go of the past. You've been trying so hard. And, and I think Paul just wants to say to you and remind you, uh, listen, I understand the barriers. There, 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 there are going to be barriers that you don't even understand that have had power over your life and addictions in your life where you're not going to understand. And I need you to know that even those barriers, Jesus has the power. He has the authority to topple even those. Verse 10, again, I just want to say this sentence again. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. In Christ, you have, hear me today, no matter what the barrier is, you have everything you need. And Jesus has the power and authority to remove or help you through and around those barriers, and that's what he wants to do. Last thing uh, about that story that I didn't tell, the way that my son Luke kind of came into the world 
left him with a, uh, he was, he was B-strep positive. Some of you know what that means, some of you don't. What that means is he had a virus as he came in because we didn't have time to get set up. And, and so when he came into the world, uh, pretty quick we found out that he had a, he had a virus and his, all of a sudden they, they check him and his counts go off the charts. And they say, hey, listen, we got we to get him help quick. And, and, and we got to get him, I mean, literally, I remember them putting him in a box I remember him wheeling, them wheeling him out the door. My little guy, I've never felt more powerless in my life. And the only thing that I could do was go up to this room and, and literally stand outside this box as they're medicating him and as they're checking on him and for days in the NICU. And, and literally all I had was prayer. All I had was God's promise of his goodness and kindness no matter what the outcome. And so I'm just telling you, um, some of the barriers that some of you are facing, you're like, yeah, it, you know, it, it's kind of funny story. The lanes are clogged. You had to go around and you had to do this. And yeah, you know what? You know, I probably am linking in a few things with religion. And you know what? I can be a little legalistic and I can be. And you're thinking, yeah, I need to change some of these things. But I just, I just want to be real for a second. I want to make sure that you know that the barriers between you and real life are the deep and personal ones that you feel powerless to change. And I just want you to know, friend, that those are the very ones that Jesus laid his life down to give you power, to give you fullness, and to lead you into real life. He can and he will. No matter what the barrier is that's standing between you and all of the promises that Jesus has, I want you to know that it's not through your effort and it's not through your trying harder that you're going to step into the real life that you're made for. You're going to step into the real life that you're made for when you get on your knees and you humble yourself and say, Jesus, listen, I know you've already given me this free gift. I know that the battle's already won. I know that this good thing that you've planted in me is on its way. And I'm telling you today that I trust you I believe in you, and I need you. And I need you to get me through these barriers. I need you to get me through these obstacles so I can step into real life. And that is the only way that you'll step into the real life he made you for. Uh, uh, Yeah, so we like, we got the, the gym here. This is kind of where it all started, you know. Uh, this is where we have our church services, our Sunday morning gatherings. Host on maybe a regular service, probably 200 to 230 guys um, all in here worshiping and giving praise, man. It's a beautiful thing. So I'm Naquan Thurman, I'm uh, uh, 32 years old. Um, I'm from Hodgenville, Kentucky, small town in LaRue County. Went to school, high school there. Um, it was really awesome. Uh, but throughout that process, like shortly after high school, um, you know, I um, picked up drinking, you know what I'm saying? And um, uh, started to kind of live the uh, party life, so to speak, and if I could, describe my addiction in any way, it would be the party that never ended. Okay. I'm doing all right. You go so this here. is my main man, Heavy. Uh, heavy as the Southeast. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, so Heavy I worked with through the whole time, my entire time uh, here. Uh, we went through the program here together. It's been really awesome, man, working with you. Yes, love sir, you, I love you, brother, yeah, man. I love you too, dog. <laughs> Have a good day, bro. Yeah. And so I came here. I didn't really um, know much about Crown coming in here. But um, prior to coming here, um, I had actually started watching Southeast Online, um, you know, to kind of renew my faith and try to get, you know, get connected and, and get back active um, with my faith. Um, and uh, it just so happened that when I arrived here, Southeast was here on campus at Crown. 
um, you know, having worship service. And um, so I immediately um, wanted to get involved. So honestly, for me, it all kind of started like right here. So I would just sit behind the information desk here and help people out as they came in. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, hello, you need to know where to go. I got you. I can, I'll lead you there. Now that I've gotten through the program here, um, I almost have a year, a year of sobriety coming up. And, um, you know, he's freed me from the chains of alcoholism. That was a blessing in itself, major blessing, changed my life. Like I went home this past weekend and uh, was able to go pick up my daughter for the first time. Took her to Chuck E. Cheese, which was exciting. She loved it. Um, you know, so to be able to uh, get back those things that um, addiction, you know, had taken away from me is just a uh, super blessing. So I'm a business analyst here at Crown. Um, I uh, am responsible for um, tracking the group efficiency data. I kind of do a lot. I just try my best to um, help guys. Uh, my main thing is them to maintain their sobriety and um, develop a relationship with Christ, you know what I'm saying? And uh, that's what I do here. <laughs> you know Recovery looks different for a lot of people. And so, uh, but for me, it was God Bella, and Bella. recovery. Bella. Um, I committed to my faith and I committed to the process of recovery. And uh, it completely changed my life. Um, 11 months ago, I did not see myself here, you know, with a career. Um, my dream job, my, you know, working for a church, you know, a leader in a church, you know, I, I was just laying in my bed with no job, you know what I'm saying? Like just watching church online, you know, and, uh, and I would just encourage you to reach out, just take that first step, because um, it's most definitely worth it. All right, church family, we're going to move into a special time of our service that we take every week, and that time is communion. And here at our campuses, when we take communion, we do it by grabbing one of these little things. There's a small piece of bread and a small cup of juice, and together they, they represent, they, they present to us the body of Jesus laid down on the cross, and then the blood of Jesus poured out that initiated a new covenant and it invited us into this new relationship with the Father. My encouragement to you is, man, if you know you're going to be engaging with us online consistently, that you would just go and get you some things that can hold this place for you. You know, we always encourage you to go grab whatever you can, grab some bread, grab some juice. But I want to challenge you into some intentionality to, to really treat this moment as a sacred moment and also a sacred privilege for you every week. And you just heard an amazing story uh, from Naquan. And, and as I begin to think about Naquan's story, I begin to think about this beautiful picture, this, this dance of sorts between uh, human effort and God's sovereign intentionality. When you hear Naquan's story, you hear a lot of human effort, but you also see these pearls strung together of God's intentional imprint on his life. And I'm standing on a place on our campus where you can clearly see the beauty of what that looks like. There's evidence of a, a lot of human uh, effort, you know, with the concrete and planting of the flowers and the planting of the trees. But, but the intentionality, the sovereign intentionality of God who created the plants and who created the elements, uh, those things are held in place because of him. And so that's the beauty of Jesus coming. Uh, we learned that Jesus put on flesh and he walked amongst us in human form. And he went to the cross and died a very human death. But early that Sunday morning, we saw the sovereign intentionality of the Father that raised Jesus from the grave. And, and it presents to us this beautiful but bloody uh, picture of what can happen uh, when we die to ourselves and we accept the love and the freedom that comes from Christ. And, and that was Naquan's story. And, and in this moment, if you're taking communion, that means that that's your story too. So in the next song, uh, you're going to have an opportunity to sit with God. And I challenge you to do that. Sit with God. Reflect on your rescue story, how God has used his sovereign intentionality and how he's invited you into your human efforts to strive and to live and to love like him until he returns. So cast your eyes to heaven. Get your bread. Get your juice. Let's take communion.
now to do the same thing for me. When we say that we need him, we cry out. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your
welcome back, everybody. I hope that you have just enjoyed serving this morning. I hope that that message just really spoke to you, and I hope that you engage with us in some awesome worship. Man, we're going to bring Stephen in. We're going to just talk a little mm -hmm. bit about, man, what we loved most about the message. What's up, Stephen? Yo, Terrence. Yeah, man, what a great message from Matt talking about real life and just all the different barriers. I think, I think for me personally, Colossians 2 is one of the most powerful uh, chapters mm -hmm. of the Bible God's used personally in my life, and especially that part about um, you, can't, you can't go living this new life, okay? You can't go add mm -hmm. things to it on your own power. And I love that verse where it says, uh, and Matt did a great job of highlighting it, is that you continue to live just the way you receive. You know, like Terrence, it was a miraculous work of God that brought us in right relationship right. with God through Jesus. And that's the way you continue to live. It's, there's no other mystery to it. Mm. And it's so tempting, those of us on the other side of it, we just want to go do this in our own power in return to the old ways rather than receiving and living in the new ways. I don't know, man, what, what was sticking out to you, Terrence, uh, as you were looking at the message this weekend? Yeah, absolutely, man. I, I think the thread of just truly like naming it, like sometimes when we yep. engage in some of the spiritual formation work that God is calling us through to through the scriptures or through a message, it's easy to stay vague. It's easy to not really want to yep. name the thing. And I think you all did yep. a really great job of naming stuff and challenging us to really name it and to come to this position to understand that you can't have both. Right. When you, when you come to yeah. Christ, it's Christ and Christ alone. And so you have to sit yeah. the old things down. But before you can sit them down, you got to know what they are. And so it takes courage to name those things. And I love just that practical challenge that we have. Well, it's not lost on me where I'm at at a recovery center, how important that is, right? You've got to fully move in and transition to a new life, uh, and you've got to do that. It's a miraculous power that we are saved, and never forget that day by day that it's that miraculous power that continues on, Terrence. It's, it's really, really good yeah. stuff. And we hope that you all connect with today's message. If you did and you want to go to that next level with us, we say this all the time. We meet at Text to Work Connect. Uh, to 733 733. People like me uh, and my team will follow up with you with SE Online and we'll be able to connect with you uh, and get you going on your journey. The other thing I want to let our online family know is it seems like October's far away, but it's not. We have homecoming coming up October 7th, 8th, and 9th, and registration is now open. As a matter of fact, go down in the chat and our chat hosts are going to be putting a link to sign up for homecoming. Homecoming is the SE online opportunity for us to gather together in Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky, taking service together. But it's more than that. It's a chance to hang out with a couple hundred of your SE online family from across the country and around the world. We'll be right here in October. So clear your calendars and sign up today and show up in Louisville, Kentucky. And I also, Terrence, want to bring you back in because everybody needs to show up online again next week because our brother Terrence is bringing right. the work. Can you give us <laughs> one quick preview, Terrence? What are they going to hear from you next week? We're in Colossians chapter 3. What are you going to be sharing about? And uh, give us a little quick preview. Yeah, so, you know, I think you're, you're going to be hearing about uh, the practicalities of living out the real life. What does it look like to uh, live out life in Christ? And so I'm just going to be giving you some yep. practical implications and some steps to what that looks like. So I hope you guys tune in and, and get ready to take some notes. Awesome. Well, Terrence, what a great weekend. Love getting to worship here with our crown fellas. Love getting to see you and all you at home. Thanks for being a part of Southeast Online. We will continue in real life next weekend. See y'all. Bye.